We're going to go back here just a little bit and see what they're talking about right here. Reached. Pertaining to uh, presidential immunity argument and claim that has reached the Supreme Court. But, and Kush, if President Trump and his lawyers make this immunity argument in all his cases, could it hit pause on those as well moving forward, whether it's federal or state? Well, look, I mean, practically speaking here, he, he's just trying to get past November and hope that he wins uh, the election and that, you know, he can shut down the federal cases and put all the state cases on ice. Um, I, I think, look, the, the, the DA's case in Manhattan, that looks like it's... Look at that. Look at all that. Is that not total chaos? Especially somebody that's supposed to be... Or that's standing in charge of being our chief and commander is that not total chaos sure it is go to trial on march 25th the case in georgia i think is is in limbo to put it charitably as a result of what's been going on with the uh, the prosecutors and the hearing down there in the case in florida i think it was ambitious to ever think it was going to go to trial uh this summer but it, to my eye it, the, the odds that that will go to trial before november are practically zero at this point judge cannon does not seem to uh, uh want that to happen so um we are looking at a scenario here where kind of the one case that goes to trial is the one that is regarded by many people as perhaps the weakest legally and the least consequential politically and Garrett, let's turn to the other development where the, the legal and political collide. What can you tell us about the Illinois judge's decision? Oh, I'm being told Secretary Austin is now speaking on Capitol Hill. We're going to go there live. Everybody, thank you for joining us. Listen up. The department is deeply focused now on meeting the pacing challenge from the People's Republic of China, on making the Middle East more secure after the October 7th terrorist assault on Israel and on ensuring that Ukraine can continue to defend itself against Putin's war of, of aggression. So as always, we are focused on the defense of our nation. But I know that Congress has some legitimate concerns about some issues around my illness. So let me start by thanking all those who offered me well wishes uh, after my recent... We're going to go through the uh, formalities here real quick. I've done seeing part of this. Let's go on here a little bit here. Keep going, keep going, keep going. He's thanking people and trying to um, express his gratitude. All right, here's where we here's where we start getting Decide serious. Decide that the president should know about your hospitalization. As I understand it, my chief of staff. Back it up. That we we can hear all the the whole question. There. Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member Smith, I appreciate your leadership on that score, and I stand ready to assist you in any way. And with that, I'll be glad to take your questions. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. Chairman now yields his question time to the Chairman of the Subcommittee on Military Personnel, the gentleman from Indiana, Mr. Banks. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Secretary, help us get this straight. At what point during your hospital stay did you or your staff decide that the President should know about your hospitalization? As I understand it, my chief of staff uh, contacted uh, the national security advisor and advised him that I'd been hospitalized on the 4th of, Jan uh, 4th of January. At what point during your stay was the 4th of January? I'm sorry, I didn't hear How long into your stay was that? <coughs> well, uh, as we've uh, pointed out, uh, as it's been pointed out earlier, I, uh, days, I was admitted days to the hospital after you were on the 1st of January. Right. Okay. Um, yes or no, did you tell your staff not to inform the president, anyone on your staff? I never told anyone not to inform uh, the president, the White House, or anyone else about my hospital hospitalization. Okay, so the 30-day the review summary uh, lays a lot of blame at the feet of your staff. Uh, it, it seems that that would appear, correct? For the breakdown in the process? You've told us that... You are responsible, but the 30-day the review seems to blame your staff. Well, the 30-day review pointed out that, uh, uh, that there were uh, some missteps, and, and, uh, but there was never any ill intent or an intent to obfuscate some. Uh, one year ago, you told me in this hearing room you had no regrets about what happened in Afghanistan. Do you, re do you regret what happened here? I've said that uh, we didn't get this right, uh, uh, Congressman.
enforcement, and uh, we put measures in place to ensure that the notification process uh, is improved going forward. Mr. Secretary, okay. who, who will be held accountable? The transfer of authority uh, was... Uh, who will happened. be held accountable for this? This, again, embar this embarrassment. Again, I take full responsibility, and we put measures in place to, uh, uh, to address uh, the, uh, the shortcomings. Are you surprised the president didn't call for your resignation? I'm surprised, but are you surprised that he didn't call for your resignation? The president has expressed, expressed full <laughs> faith and confidence in me. So you're not surprised that he didn't call for your resignation. Is it typical that the president would go three days without talking to his secretary of defense? Is that typical or is that a regular posture? Do you usually go days without talking to the commander? -in I mean, that can happen. It depends on if we're, whether or not the president's uh, on on the, uh, on travel. If I'm on travel, uh, there are times when we we do go days without direct communication. So the the big issue for me here is either the president is that aloof, or you are irrelevant. Wh which one is it, Mr. Secretary? That you it's would go three, that the president would go three days without knowing that his secretary of defense is is not on the job it's neither uh the president is not aloof and uh and i am uh i participate in uh in all of the uh, uh let, let me ask you this well, on department. january 2nd while you were in the hospital president biden was vacationing in the caribbean You're he said critical decision making is what he said because the uh congressman interfered with his answer he was he was trying to get his answer out, and the congressman obviously uh, is too gun ho towards wanting to ask another question. So that was the answer. Your deputy, who the president didn't even know had operational control, was on a beach in Puerto Rico. What kind of message does that send to our adversaries? Uh, the key piece is that, number one, uh, the deputy has uh, the ability to... Uh, uh, she has access to secure communications. She has the ability to participate in decision-making uh, processes from wherever she is. Mr. Secretary, our, 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 our adversaries should fear us, <coughs> and what you've done has embarrassed us. And let, let me sum this up by this. A leading Chinese propaganda outlet said that what, hap what happened to you exposed, quote, internal chaos. A leading Russian propaganda outlet said that your disappearance, quote, effectively compromised the gentleman's time's expired. Chair now recognizes the chair. Chair now recognizes the ranking member. First of all, let me say it is not remotely surprising to me that the Chinese and the Russians are not going to say anything positive about us. Uh, that doesn't come as a surprise to me. They seize on every opportunity to attack the United States. So I don't really take their word for what was going on. And a couple things to drill down on. One, is, it is fairly routine that the Secretary of Defense will be in places where you are not able to do everything you need to do, and that authority is transferred. And I think a lot of people don't fully understand this. So can you walk us through, I mean, how often does it happen that you are in a place where you can't do, you can't be as responsive as you need to be so that you pass the authority on to your Deputy Secretary? Uh, thanks. Uh, as pointed out in the 30-day uh, review, there have been a number of times uh, in the, uh, uh, in the past where uh, we transferred authorities because of uh, my inability to, to uh, have access to secure communications. Uh, and then w once uh, I, I had the ability to uh, have access again to secure communications, that was transferred back. So that, uh, and, and the number of times that that's happened is outlined in the 30-day uh, review. And was there, again, just to emphasize, was there any time during this process in the, the first days of January when you were in the hospital, any time whatsoever when the deputy secretary wasn't in a position to fully carry out the responsibilities of the secretary of defense, regardless of whether she was in Puerto Rico or Bermuda, Mexico or Mar-a-Lago or wherever, she was <laughs> in a position to carry out all of the authorities that she had as the acting secretary of defense in that instance, correct? She is legally and logistically uh, positioned to assume the functions, and, and she was, uh, you're right, in a position to, to be able to, uh, to support the president as, uh, as chief of staff, as, uh, as, uh, you know, as he made decisions. So, um, co Commander-in-Chief. So, um, she always has uh, secure communications with her, just like me, uh, and she has a situational awareness uh, that uh, that's needed to be uh, to, 
to be able to make uh, effective uh, <coughs> recommendations to the president. Uh, and she, working with the uh, chairman of the Joint Chiefs and also the combined commander, would propose uh, options for the president in any situation. Certainly. And one of the things I want to emphasize as this hearing goes forward is not to use this to the advantage of our adversaries, to use it as a partisan attack. There was nothing embarrassing about what happened here. There was nothing that makes us appear weak. The United States, as all of this was going on, as has been pointed out, was carrying out strikes against our adversary in order to protect our force. We were doing everything that we needed to do to meet the national security needs of this country. And if members of this committee incorrectly imply otherwise, they are merely giving aid and comfort to those adversaries that they claim to care about confronting. And I will also one more time emphasize that if we care about confronting our adversaries, rather than nitpicking the Secretary of Defense about his precise process in this situation, we should go ahead and pass the National Security Supplemental that the Senate has passed with 70 bipartisan votes to precisely meet those national security needs. Whatever Russia and Chinese propaganda machines may be cranking out about this situation, I assure you it pales in comparison to what they're cranking out about the fact that they think the United States is getting ready to abandon our ally in Ukraine. I would challenge any member on the other side of this aisle to claim that the Secretary of Defense not fully informing the president for three days is somehow more important than walking away exactly. from that obligation that we have made exactly. that the whole world is watching us on. And with that, I yield back. Chair recognizes the gentleman from South Carolina, Mr. Wilson. Thank you, Chairman Mike Rogers. Secretary Austin, I first want to wish you a full and speedy recovery. And sadly, we're here today because of the failure of the properly communicate Directive 3020.04 <coughs> of the Department of Defense, which is critical information requirements through the chain of command to President Biden. As a grateful veteran myself, along with you, of the American Armed Forces, we both understand the crucial role of the chain of command to provide time-sensitive information to make the right decisions at the right time. When communications fails, there is an increased risk to mission success, but more importantly, increased risk to the servicemen and women. For this, to me, it's personal as a 31-year Army veteran myself, having four sons who served in Afghanistan, Iraq, and Egypt, and currently my district director is deployed in Africa. I just take this personally with the South Carolina National Guard uh, that uh, your service is just so critically important. <laughs> And I appreciate having worked with you before your appointment, and we need your proven capabilities more than ever, as we are in a war we did not choose, of dictators with rule of gun invading democracies with rule of law. It began February 24, 2022, with war criminal Putin invading Ukraine on October 7, 2023. Iran puppet Hamas invaded Israel as the Chinese Communist Party threatens Taiwan. Sadly, uh, Biden opened borders for terrorists, makes imminent more 9-11 attacks across on American families, and we need our state national guards to be ready for duty. Every family actually should have a rally point when communications are cut with an attack. With the current global threats, uh, today, uh, there are attacks on America and, and our allies uh, in, uh, by Iran in the Middle East with the lack of uh, proper communication to degrade our ability to respond. Uh, again, uh, I would emphasize that there was never uh, a break in um, uh, command and control. Uh, there was the... Uh, um, we transferred uh, authorities uh, in a timely fashion. Uh, what uh, we didn't do well was a, notif a notification of, uh, of uh, senior leaders. So. And, and we I put measures in hey, place to fix I deeply it. regret the response we had was ineffective uh, by uh, delaying a response. Uh, and uh, it should have been an immediate response on launch sites, and it should have been very effective, and there should have been no notice. And so what was done uh, really has put American families at greater risk. And as I conclude, I want to express our sympathy for the family of Alexei Navalny, who was assassinated by war criminal Putin. His widow, Yulia, is a hero for the oppressed people of Russia. I yield back. Chair, now recognize the gentleman from Connecticut, Mr. Courtney. Please. Thank you, <laughs> thank you, Mr. Rogers, and thank you, uh, Mr. Secretary, uh, for being here today and for your 
40 plus years of service uh, to the defense of our country. Again, just to, to sort of walk through one more time about the fact that there was no gap in terms of authorities and, and who was in control of the department. Uh, you went into critical care <laughs> on January 2nd. Your staff uh, then executed the law in terms of notifying the deputy secretary of defense that she was in charge. And as a result, I mean, there was, it was seamless. There, there, was, there was just never any moment where there was any um, um, absence of, of authority within the department. Isn't that correct? That's correct, sir. And again, it, it, it actually was the Armed Services Committee back in 1962 that passed the law that, again, made this process happen, again, without any action, special action of the Secretary of Defense. It's different, actually, than the 25th Amendment of the Constitution, where if a president is going to go under anesthesia or is incapacitated, um, there, it, it actually says in Section 3 of the, of the amendment that there has to be a voluntary surrender. Again, going back to President Reagan, um, he actually executed documents, filed it with the Congress, notifying that that was going to happen. That's not the way the law works for the Department of Defense. Again, it happens, again, if the secretary is unable to perform duties, then that's it. The deputy secretary is in charge. Isn't that correct? That's correct, sir. And then on January 8th, before even the 30-day review or any of the recommendations, you already moved to, to, to put into place a, a, a a regulation that basically <clears throat> states that this now will be communicated in all instances to the president of the United States so that the, the whatever confusion surrounding the, the uh, lack of communication now has been now codified at, at the department to make sure it doesn't happen again. Isn't that correct? That's correct, sir. And we uh, we had a, uh, the opportunity to put those uh, procedures in, in, uh, in play. Uh, when I went back to the hospital on uh, February 11th, and it was uh, there was uh, a timely notification in a seamless fashion. So speaking of gaps, let's talk about the supplemental. Because uh, on February 13th, the United States Senate, actually by a vote of 77 to 21, it was more than the 70 votes that my friend Mr. Smith cited, um, overwhelmingly endorsed uh, a package which will provide $60 billion to Ukraine, who is in a very dire state today. Um, so 16 days later, we're here in this room. We're thankfully going to, looks like we're going to move forward on a FY24 final package soon. Uh, but the fact is, is that um, nothing has happened in the House to follow up with the Senate. Did. The Speaker explicitly said he will let the House work its will in terms of next steps with the supplemental package. I think everybody in this room knows if the bill was brought to the floor, we would get an overwhelming majority vote pretty darn close to two-thirds. I've talked to some Republicans who said it would be 300 votes. What's, what's the risk, what's that risk of that gap in terms of our national security and, and helping our allies? Well, we're, we're seeing the risk uh, play out on the battlefield uh, each and every day as, uh, as the Ukrainians fight valiantly to defend uh, uh, their sovereign territory. And I would uh, remind everyone that uh, what I, with our support and providing uh, security assistance, uh, they've taken back half of the, uh, the territory <laughs> that, uh, that Russia uh, seized. Uh, but each and every day, uh, we see the Russians continuing to push and make incremental gains, uh, and that's very troubling. And without our, without our support, uh, the Ukrainians will be uh, outgunned in terms of artillery, uh, and uh, and they'll also be at risk because of lack of uh, air adequate air defense. Gentleman's time's expired. Chair, I recognize the gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Turner. Chair, now recognize the gentleman from Colorado, Mr. Lambert. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and for having this hearing, uh, Mr. Secretary. We do wish you a speedy and full recovery. I would concur with the points brought up by the chairman. I believe most members of this committee are bewildered at how these events could transpire. I am primarily concerned with the effect of your actions and the actions of your closest advisor <coughs> on the confidence of the American people. At a time when overall trust in the government is declining, Americans must still believe that the government can protect them from the growing threats in this world. And one of the most serious threats is that of a missile attack from Russia, China, or North Korea. I chair the Strategic Forces Subcommittee and am charged by the chairman with the oversight of our entire nuclear arsenal, including the command and control of our nuclear forces. 
Every day, our service members who maintain and operate the weapon systems that employ these destructive weapons are ready to act within minutes of receiving a valid order from the president that flows down through you or your designated representative. Today, many on this dais will speak about disruptions in chains of command. I will say that the most dangerous change of command to break is that which communicates orders to our missile silos, ballistic missile submarines, and strategic bombers. We will only deter attacks on our homeland if our adversaries are assured that we are capable and willing to respond in kind massively if necessary. Not only is our homeland threatened by adversaries, ballistic missiles, but will increasingly be threatened by hypersonic missiles. So all of these attacks are a matter of minutes, not hours. Okay, we'll keep listening to this ongoing testimony. I've been listening to the Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin testifying on the Hill, addressing the issues around lack of transparency when he was hospitalized in January following surgery for prostate cancer. And joining us now is NBC News Pentagon correspondent Courtney Cuby and retired U.S. Army Lieutenant General Steph Twitty, a former Deputy Commander of the United States European Command and NBC News military analyst. So, Courtney, let me start with you. This testimony was sort of a long time coming. Uh, lots of pressure coming, especially from Republicans, to hear directly from the Secretary and be able to ask their questions about uh, why he wasn't more transparent, what it meant when it came to national security issues and all of that. What are your takeaways from what we've heard so far and where this is all headed? Yeah, so there has been some pretty fiery exchanges already, primarily from Republicans to Secretary Austin, and including, it. frankly, on it started right at the very top with the chairman, um, uh, Congressman Rogers, right off the bat with some, I mean, kind of surprising language saying that um, he was surprised that Secretary Austin, uh, it didn't seem that anyone noticed that he wasn't in the job for three or four days, and it questioned his role as Secretary of Defense. And then the first line of questioning from Republicans, we, we heard the same thing, even asking, uh, one of them asking Secretary Austin if he's irrelevant and if President Biden is aloof. So all that being said, yes, this is a, a, a hearing room. There's both sides <coughs> of the aisle. We're, we're, we're hearing pretty much what we expected from them. Republicans very critical of this, Democrats not. But so far, we haven't really gotten any new facts or information on this yet, Anna. I did think it was interesting to hear in the secretary's opening statement him talk about this 30-day review that had taken place within the Pentagon and the eight recommendations that came from that review that he said he is implementing, two of which he said have already been implemented, uh, related to immediate notification in the future and even writing down his reason if he were to be incapacitated or unable to assume the helm at any given moment. General, there's obviously a lot of politics surrounding this hearing, but how real or serious do you think the concerns are around the lack of transparency by Austin? Yeah, let me just say a couple of things, Anna. N number one is I think I need to tell you that uh, I know this gentleman quite well. Uh, he's a dear friend of mine. Uh, I've served with him in the Army. He was my commander both in garrison, and I had the honor to serve with him in combat in Iraq. And so I know him quite well. And I don't think there is any intent here to mislead or obfuscate uh, any work. What I think happened here is a case where uh, you have uh, what we call in the Army commander's intent, and you have people around you that you assume will do the right thing. In this case here, uh, false to be blamed on him, yes, when it comes to sound judgment, but also on his staff for also not uh, reporting, even though uh, um, Secretary Austin did not do the right thing. All right, General Twitty and Courtney Cuby, thank you. Just moments ago, President Biden spoke to reporters at the White House as he leaves to go to the border. He's talking about the latest in Gaza. Let's listen. <laughs>
point, the president now headed to the border to talk about immigration policy this afternoon. Let me bring in NBC's Monica Alba covering the White House and NBC's Matt Bradley, who's been covering the Israel-Hamas war, facing questions this morning, Monica, about what's happening in the Middle East because of some uh, overnight developments. What can you tell us? Yeah, Anna, and I was able to put that question to him about whether he still hopes for a temporary ceasefire by Monday based on those comments he made earlier in the week <coughs> indicating it was a possibility. And you saw there he said hope springs eternal, and he's been talking to some of the key players in the region. But he did indicate that likely it won't happen by Monday, maybe a little bit later, he said. But he's still hopeful that that could coalesce for there to be a temporary pause in the fighting so that some some of the remaining hostages can get out in certain waves as we know they've been talking about that and having very intense negotiations on that for weeks and for months notably then Anna he was asked about that story this morning of Israel opening fire on Gazans who were trying to get some aid surrounding some trucks and obviously there are reports now that dozens have been killed more injured and the president in responding to that question said he's been tracking that closely but that there are some conflicting reports. And the most possibly important part of that response was that he was asked whether that will complicate these talks and these negotiations. And he told reporters, I know it will, because of course this is all happening at the same time as they're trying to get to that place. But we know that this complicates this potentially, and it puts it, of course, in a far more significant focus as they were trying to get closer to that. But this, of course, latest development could really derail some of that progress and the president said he expects to learn more about that as the day unfolds on it we do have video of that violent event that took place the aftermath of it there in gaza this morning after one of viewers it is graphic and it's just disturbing no doubt about it at least 100 people are, are reportedly dead after the israel israeli military opened fire they confirmed yes they opened fire saying that the people posed a threat to israeli soldiers they also said Say some casualties might have been caused by trampling in the crowd. Matt, what more are we learning about exactly what happened here? Yeah, well, you're seeing, I think, some of those satellite images. This was the latest tragedy out of the Gaza Strip. More than 100 people killed. And the Gaza Ministry of Health says it's 104 people who were killed. Now, the Israelis, as you mentioned, they've come out and said that what happened was that civilians crowded around a del aid delivery truck, which, by the way, aid to the Gaza Strip has fallen by about half in just the past couple of weeks, this according to the United Nations. So there was a major desperation. We've been seeing famine in the Gaza Strip, as well as deadly disease. And now we've been seeing infants over the past couple of days who have died and according to the gaza ministry of health they've died because of starvation so it is a very desperate situation. my god this is uh this has reached a level of humanitarian disaster that goes beyond anything that anybody could have foreseen that was going to occur but once more the blame should be shifted upon to Hamas because of their actions in trying to desecrate the people over in Israel. It's, it's a horrifying situation that most Americans have not witnessed since World War II situation people were surrounding this truck the palestinian side says that the israelis opened <coughs> fire with a machine gun and that is what killed more than 100 people the israelis say that a lot of those people were trampled to death as they tried to reach the aid regardless this just goes to show the level of desperation in the gaza strip and we've reached another very very great milestone just today on a 30 000 people reportedly killed by israeli attacks in the gaza strip ever since the offensive began back in october this also according to the Gaza Ministry of Health. These numbers are considered very reliable uh, by the United Nations, the Lancet Journal, and the United States. They tend to agree with these figures. Uh, Matt Bradley and Monica Alba, thank you both. 30,000 people. Next year, Ana Cabrera reports a split-screen showdown as President Biden and Donald Trump plan dueling border visits today, plus a changing of the guard. The horse race already happening in the halls of Congress to replace... 30,000 people. Just in that one event, beginning in October, whenever Hamas decided to attack the people over in Israel. 
War has never been a glorious thing. It's very and and as far as I'm concerned, war will never be a glorious thing because ultimately, in the end, it's a uh, uh, not it, it's a catastrophe for both sides. Let's go on back right here. This was I found this uh, to be pretty uh, intense, is what they was talking about here. Hopefully, I'll be able to get it. I think I can. But I'm doing well. I mean, I, I, and, and, and quite frankly, I, 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 I fell into this advocacy role. Uh, I'm not sure if I am an advocate, but I talk about my drug addiction and alcoholism. I, I'm sober almost 30 years. And so that's part of my story. Is that, do you consider that one of your great accomplishments? <laughs> without a question. You know, 30 years is a long time without a drink or a drug. And, uh, but you know, I, I don't have a family. I have, I have a, I got married, I think we got married, been together 25 years. I found a great woman who just loves me and, and has been my caregiver, particularly when it's been difficult with the Parkinson's. She's, and I couldn't be happier. Upon word of the death of Richard Lewis, Larry David, which you really got a sense of their relationship um, in that interview there, uh, he tweeted out this. He had a rare combination of being the funniest person and also the sweetest. But today he made me sob. And for that, I'll never forgive him. Uh, Elise Jordan, um, Richard Lewis was funny, but that was a friendship that literally started not in the crib, in the hospital. <laughs> now, Richard Lewis was just such a sweet man, and that really came across even when his comedy could be biting. But I think what most came mm -hmm. across from him was just his kindness. You know, I was a big fan, and I felt like a friend died yesterday, and I think that so many mm -hmm. of his fans did too. Yeah, so funny. But Mike, but also so honest and so vulnerable um, about you know his addictions yes. and his struggles with, and with his health near the end as well. Um, it's such an important part of that show. He'll really be missed. You know, the word vulnerable is key to understanding Richard Lewis. Uh, I never knew Richard Lewis until about 10 or 11 years ago. I get a text from someone identifying themselves as Richard Lewis, and it was the Richard Lewis. And I was surprised that the text, was, why is he texting me? I'm a nobody. Uh, but we developed a texting relationship and then a phone call relationship. And he would call about myriad topics, sometimes in the news, sometimes about politics, sometimes about himself. And what always came through, Elise mentioned it, you just mentioned it, he was both sweet, vulnerable, and terribly insecure at a certain level. And he wrote a beautiful book that I started reading last night, and I, he, talk, he spoke about his addiction, but I just didn't really know the depths of it, and it really is an important book and a contribution that will outlive his comedy even. All right, coming up, uh, CNBC is spotlighting women who are setting the standard for what it takes to defy the odds and thrive in the business world today. We're breaking that. We're going to go forward here now. With Dexcom G. I feel quite, quite confident in saying that the women today. Um, and tech to sports and medicine. That the women today are still having to take second seat to the men in regards towards. Um, in regards towards the women's lib movement that I think began uh, politically shortly after World War II, but did not fully get accepted until basically the either the 50s or the 60s. And I can vouch by living here in the state of Tennessee of how hard it was for my mother to go through what she was going through 
pertaining to a post-traumatic stress disorder, World War II drill sergeant or whatever he was um, in his command, that um, that things was not available in this area towards assisting uh, abused, abused women until basically uh, later throughout the late 70s, early 80s, whenever it was now too late for her because at that time before that, she had to make a decision towards either staying in a viable relationship with her husband or taking a chance on leaving her husband and not being able to feed her family, her three boys. It wasn't until after my brother died in 1976 was whenever that harshness really become that much more real in her life that fortunately my older brother was already on his own. And by the time I got ready to get on my own at the age of 15, getting a, a temporary uh, driver's license at the time toward being signed by a parent, an adult, um, was whenever us, we, finally drawed up enough conclusion that mother, you only have one child now to be concerned with. You can do this. You can break away from this type of abusive abusivenesses. And that's whenever she decided to file for a divorce and go live with her mother over in Kenton, Tennessee. The women today are still struggling just as much in areas towards becoming equal as what it began years and years ago, as far as I'm concerned. Now, that's just my personal opinion about it, and we'll let it go with that. The inaugural CNBC Changemakers List celebrates women who are using their leadership positions to change the world. And joining us now, CNBC senior media and tech correspondent Julia Burston. She is author of the book that jump-started this initiative, entitled, of course, When Women Lead, What They Achieve, Why They Succeed, and How We Can Learn from them. Julia, uh, thank you for coming on. You know I love this. Um, let's start with how you put this together, how, how you got it um, all like organized, lined up, and then ultimately, who's on this list? Well, um, we're so excited about this list. We had over 700 nominations, and we had the guidance of an amazing advisory board of business leaders to help us figure out which quantitative and qualitative metrics to consider here. We really wanted to make sure to highlight women with reach and impact, and particularly to focus in on their accomplishments over the past year. So what we got is a list with a huge amount of diversity, women in 17 different industries. We have women who are using technology to change the philanthropic world, uh, which is really an unusual angle for a business list. But what we're really trying to do here is include women. You know, we have four women in sports. I see you're showing um, Naomi Osaka. We have some high profile women um, like Taylor Swift uh, uh, as well. Some big celebrities or Tracy Ellis Ross, an actor who is now building a business in the consumer product space with Pattern Beauty. And then women who are innovating um, across green energy and healthcare as well. Actually, the biggest sector represented was the healthcare space. So let's look at some of these categories like purpose and profit, um, because there there's women who are really, I mean, exploding in so many different fields. Um, so narrow it down for us. We'll start with these change makers. Take it away. Yep. Yeah, so one thing we found here is that there were a range of women on the list who were figuring out how to build businesses that did good but also did well. And so really aligning the success of their companies with having a social or an environmental or or a greater impact on health. And a couple of these women I'm just going to point out is um, Svanika uh, Balasubramanian, who runs a company called Repurpose Global that's working to minimize plastic that's created by companies and also remove that plastic from the environment. And she's making money while doing something that has such a good environmental impact. Or Jessica Chang, who runs upwards and is trying to bring down the cost of health uh, of childcare and make it more accessible. Or Laura Modi, who runs uh, a company called Bobby that does formula. And what she really did was address the formula shortage and create a more healthy alternative to some of the formulas that are out there. Or Mayan Cohen, um, who runs a company called Hello Heart that is addressing heart health that's helping consumers, but also helping employers bring down their costs. Also on the change makers list, you're honoring women who are creating new businesses. Tell us about them. 
So many women on the list identified gaps in the market, said there are industries that are existing that are maybe helping male consumers but are overlooking people like me. So Kate Ryder is a perfect example of this. She created Maven Health, which is really reimagining women's health care. Monique Rodriguez created Miel Organics because she wanted a natural hair care solution for people like her, and that has turned out to be a massive success. And then there is this whole other category of women who are creating new solutions for women renewable energy. Kathy Hannon um, has Dandelion Energy, which is trying to get the, the business of geothermal energy um, more mainstream uh, as, as an amazing renewable energy source. And then Atosha Cave, who works at, and, and is a co-founder of the company 12, she's been working on a technology that transforms carbon dioxide into fuel. Well, congratulations on the release of this list, you being the inspiration for it with your book, CNBC's Julia Gorson. Thank you so much. <coughs> and you, coming up, thank you, Doc Brown and Marty McFly are now on. There are so many different areas that women, um, I believe, are better at various occupations than men. But then again, there's other areas where men still stand strong in their occupations and doing what they do. It has to be, to me, equally designed. Let's go back to this. DOD Inspector General is still working on his own independent review, which we fully support. Now, before I take your questions, I want to again make one thing very clear. At no time during my treatment or recovery were there any gaps in authorities, and there were no risks to the department's command and control. And from the time that I resumed my duties on January 5th, I fully participated in national security decision-making <coughs> on events in the Middle East and, and about military operations in self-defense to protect our troops and our facilities over there. Again, we're moving swiftly to put uh, some helpful new procedures in place to prevent any lapses in notification. And I am confident that we will not experience the same issues in the future. So let me again thank you for the opportunity to be here today and for everything that this committee does to support, uh, to, to stand by the mission and the people of the Department of Defense, including their families. I know you understand this, but one of the best things that you can do right now to support them is to pass a full year appropriation. And doing so will ensure that our troops get paid, that our civilian employees can stay on a job, <laughs> and that we can c continue to procure and feel the very best capabilities to defend our country. We need the flexibility and stability that full-year appropriations provide. Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member Smith, I appreciate your leadership on that score, and I stand ready to assist you in any way. And with that, I'll be glad to take your questions. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. Chairman now yields his question time to the Chairman of the Subcommittee on Military Personnel, the gentleman from Indiana, Mr. Banks. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Secretary, help us get this straight. At what point during your hospital stay did you or your staff decide that the President should know about your hospitalization? As I understand it, my Chief of Staff uh, contacted uh, the National Security Advisor and advised him that I'd been hospitalized on the 4th of, Jan uh, 4th of January. At what point during your stay was the 4th of January? I'm sorry, I didn't hear How long into your stay was that? Well, uh, as we've uh, pointed out, uh, as it's been pointed out earlier, I, uh, days, I was admitted days to the hospital after you were on the 1st of January. Right. Okay. Um, yes or no, did you tell your staff not to inform the president, anyone on your staff? I never told anyone not to inform uh, the president, the White House, or anyone else about my hospital hospitalization. So that should be the answer to the solution to the problems here. It's not necessarily uh, Secretary Austin that failed, but it was his staff members around him that did. I don't know why that they want to continue to keep drilling this poor man over him having complications with his health, which is to be expected probably more so today with almost everybody and their brother getting sick in some form or fashion. Keep in mind, we have just recently went through one of the most dramatic situations in the 21st century that I believe that has ever faced uh, any group of people, which was COVID, the sickness of COVID. Um, you know, we're, we're, we're dealing with a baby boomer, uh, 
situation right now to where there's massive amounts of people that's that's uh, walking up to the plate and retiring. Um, that's putting strains on the Social Security Administration. Um, in the meantime, we've got more sicknesses because we got more people. It's pretty common to be able to figure that out, or it should be. Why they want to continue to keep hammering on this guy, like he incredibly done something incredibly wrong, to me is is preposterous. I realize the concerns, and those concerns are valid. But on the level of humiliating this poor man and torturing him publicly on TV, I think, I think, this is just my, my thinking, I think is inappropriate. Okay, so the 30-day the review summary uh, lays a lot of blame at the feet of your staff. Uh, it, it seems that that would appear, correct? And rightfully so. For the breakdown in the process? You've told us that you are responsible, but the 30-day re the review seems to blame your staff. Well, the 30-day review pointed out that, uh, uh, that there were uh, some missteps, and, and, uh, but there was never any ill intent or an intent to obfuscate. So. Uh, one year ago, you told me in this hearing room you had no regrets about what happened in Afghanistan. Do you, re do you regret what happened here? I've said that uh, we didn't get this right, uh, uh, Congressman, and uh, we put measures in place to ensure that the notification process uh, is improved going forward. Mr. Secretary, uh, who, who will be the, held the accountable? The transfer of authority uh, was... Uh, who will be held accountable for this? This, again, embar this embarrassment. Again, I take full responsibility, and we put measures in place to, uh, uh, to address uh, the, uh, the shortcomings. Are you surprised the president didn't call for your resignation? I'm surprised, but are you surprised that he didn't call for your resignation? The president has expressed, expressed full faith and confidence in me. So you're not surprised that he didn't call for your resignation. Is it typical that the president would go three days without talking to his secretary of defense? Is that typical or is that a regular posture? Do you usually go days without talking to the commander? I mean, that can happen. It depends on if we're, whether or not the president's uh, on on the, uh, on travel. If I'm on travel, uh, there are times when we we do go days without direct communication. So that maybe uh, maybe going back to um, to the surrounding parties, maybe there needs to be somebody else in charge towards being able to control the beepers. That way, if something does come up. Somebody can beat the other person and say, hey, we need to talk to this guy about this particular situation. Um, let's get him online and let's, let's discuss these things. Let's go back here real quick. This is an event that, uh, that broke my heart regarding, regarding the uh, environmental crises that we're now facing all over the world. A massive smokehouse creek fire swallowing more than a million acres. Now officially the largest fire in Texas's history. A million acres. Not a thousand, but a million acres. Can you only imagine the scale and the size of that? Can you only imagine the agriculture? that this has affected in that area that will be devastating with the resources coming out of Texas. Because I'm going to go as far as to say probably, probably a, a, probably a third. I may be wrong about this statistic, but probably a third that everything that winds up in our supermarkets pertaining to beef, regardless whether it's A to Z, probably is grown and comes from Texas. So this will be devastating for that particular market. And you may not see it right now. Of course, we've already done seen the devastation ever since COVID hit. And, and especially whenever gasoline jumped up the way that it did towards, I can't even remember when the last time I sat down and actually ate just a moderate casual uh, ribeye steak with a baked potato. And sour cream. I cannot actually sit down right now and distinctively tell you when I ate 
an actual steak. Now, I was at the Peking uh, restaurant this past last Sunday because I felt better about getting out. I went to church over here at Martin, Tennessee, pertaining to a uh, rehabilitating uh, center over there that Mr. Daryl Plunk is part of. But um, even going to the Peking restaurant and eating beef, some type of beef, it still was not the adequacy to actually eat, sitting down and eating some sort of a, a steak, much less a T-bone or a sirloin or, or whatever type of steak, that, uh, New York strip or whatever type of steak you want to eat. <coughs> Today, emergency response teams are racing against time to contain the tinderbox as dangerous wind conditions move in. NBC's Guad Venegas joins us from Pampa, Texas, near Amarillo. Guad, we can, we can see it's windy. What is the situation this morning? Uh, Anna, the, the weather has changed dramatically here. Uh, it's supposed to drop as low as 27 today. Uh, we're getting what looks like grapple now. It's been snow uh, and ice all across the region, which is going to help uh, the fire. First time I've ever heard that word, Rappenau, which means, I guess, combined all together. Fire crews, right? They're going to get an edge on this fire in some areas with the temperatures dropping. Now, these winds aren't as strong as the ones that we had days ago, which helped that fire spread. So this fire you made reference to, uh, the Smokehouse Creek fire, <laughs> uh, it's already extending over 100 miles long. Uh, it's the largest in Texas state history. And that's the one. 100 miles long. That's from here to Memphis, basically, the way the crow flies. From northwest Tennessee, where I live, all the way to Memphis, Tennessee. Can you imagine a strip of property, agriculture, that has been devastated? I don't know how wide that that would be, but he's talking about 100 miles in distance in length. That's devastating. Even a half mile fire or a mile fire is devastating. Could you only imagine if something like that was to uh, hit, let's say we was going through dry devastating areas up here in this area and let's say uh land between the lakes in western kentucky that basically starts right there on the edges of grand rivers kentucky let's say that it started burning out of control and it burnt everything not only in the state of kentucky but also the lbl region and area in tennessee which i think is about 67 or 70 miles Long, can you only imagine if that whole area got burnt to a crisp? I couldn't. But that's what they're saying. As far as the, the, the width, the, the geography of it, unbelievable. It has gotten the Once more, what does the Bible say? The Bible says that we will see signs on the earth and signs up in the heaven, such as we have never, ever begun to even grasp or believe that will occur in the last days that these will be all the beginning signs of the great sorrows that will fall upon humanity in the final last days. Attention of the firefighters doing what they can to protect um, a lot of the structures that are threatened. Now you can see open fields behind me. Uh, most of the area that has been burned are, are areas like, like these. This is open fields, but there are communities, there are towns. Agriculture communities been affected. I'm going to show you what it's like on the ground right now. It's, it's almost surreal that we're dealing with wildfires and you've got snow uh, on the ground at the moment. Uh, so again, this change in temperatures can help the firefighters as they do what they can to contain that fire. The latest update indicates it's only 3% contained. 3% contained? 3% contained? Yeah, they're going to have to depend upon Mother Nature to help them out on this one, just like what happened over in uh, Boulder, Colorado. I think it was a day or two right before Christmas. I don't forgot now what year it was, whenever the fires broke out and it basically burnt over a thousand structures within just a matter of a few hours because of the winds. The only thing that helped the firefighters out was in behind those winds was a major snowstorm that actually helped to put the fire out. Unbelievable in how the first responders today have to deal with extreme, extreme situations to where even as little as, let's say, 15, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, um, 
the first responders didn't have to deal with stuff on this level of extremeness. And I personally think that these extreme extremes are only going to get more extremer, regardless whether it be here in the continental United States or in some other some other country. Tamed, uh, and they also have three other wildfires that are still considered active that they're also working uh, to contain at the moment. Uh, we also know that the state fire authorities have now changed the fire preparedness level from a two to a three. This means that they will allocate more resources, and it also came with them informing that the weather conditions indicate that they expect wildfires to continue uh, for a few more weeks. So we'll have to wait and see how this uh, goes for the next few days. Also. Look at them poor cows running for their lives. They were saying that whenever this thing first broke out, uh, just to give you some sort of an idea of the uh, severity of it, that it was burning basically 150 football fields every minute. 150 football fields every minute. That is a out of control fire. Also keeping in mind that the forecast indicates that the winds can pick up by Saturday or Sunday, which would make the conditions uh, more ideal for those fires to spread, Anna. And uh, we're looking at pictures of what is in the path. There's livestock. There are obviously people. We know one person already confirmed dead. Juan Venegas, thank you very much for that reporting. Stay safe. And that's going to do it for us today. Thank you all for joining on this pack. These are all the repercussions of climate changes and global warming that you still to this day have people that's climate deniers that refuses, refuses. And I think if I'm not mistaken, Donald Trump is one of them, refuses to believe that that what we're experiencing right now is all because of the works of humanity, hey, mankind. I want to warn you, the video you're about to see is graphic and it may be difficult to watch. The incident occurred when a crowd gathered to receive humanitarian aid at a distribution site. <coughs> Gazan officials say dozens were killed and hundreds more were injured. An Israeli official confirms to NBC News that they used live fire but said the crowd posed a threat to the soldiers. What you're dealing with whenever things get this dire is that people actually become more than just suicidal. They actually want to die. And uh, it's basically a cop by suicide scenario to where their lives are so miserable. Death is so welcomed in their, in their camp, in their encampment, that uh, they'll just about do anything to cause their own personal deaths. That's what we're looking at here. And that's the thing that frightens me, that if dire situations continue to grow proportionally out of control over there in the Middle East, um, eventually we may very well see a mushroom bomb begin over in that area. And of course, if that occurs, there ain't no telling what other uh, level of desperateness that will follow in behind that. In other words, it starts out being this size of a of a of a fire, and then it grows proportionally out of control. Are the fish that that they caught was this size, but then it goes from being a, a ten inch fish to a twelve inch fish to a twenty inch fish to basically a whale. Whenever y'all saw all said and done with, it's an environment that is out of control. And that's the thing that I continue to keep telling people about that. If we do not put our thumb on this in understanding what's happening here, we will be thrown off into great tribulation, just as the Bible talks about. And we will basically do this of our own accord because of being senseless, um, not having good leadership, um, seeing things proportionally grow out of control that goes from one extreme to another, to another, to another, goes from being bad to badder, and who knows where the baddest or the worstest of it is, because it's it's frightening to see what's going on right now in the 21st century, not just in one part of the world, but in, in the whole global society. It's, it's really frightening.
This comes as the Hamas-run Ministry of Health says that more than 30,000 people have now been killed in Gaza since the October 7th 30, attack. 30,000 people. Hour, while leaving the White House for the southern border, President Biden addressed the latest developments <laughs> out of Gaza. 30,000 people, my God. <laughs> I was on the telephone with the people in the region. I'm still probably not by Monday, but I'm hopeful. I'm just checking that out right now. The people in the region are back. I don't have an answer to that. Are you worried about our agency negotiations? I know it. It's uh, it's drastic. News military analyst. So, Josh, what more do we know about exactly what happened here today? Well, Jose, as is so often the case in the immediate aftermath of these tragic incidents, the circumstances are very much in dispute. The Palestinian uh, authorities in Gaza are calling this a massacre, saying that the Israeli military essentially unloaded on desperate Palestinians uh, simply uh, trying to get assistance that they so badly need. But the Israeli military is putting out uh, new information as they try to respond to the global uproar over this. They now say there were actually two separate Separate incidents. They say this occurred around 4 a.m. when there was a convoy of some 30 trucks, uh, and that as that convoy was moving uh, through a, a checkpoint, essentially, that uh, thousands of Palestinians surrounded those trucks trying to get the aid, uh, created uh, a stampede situation in which many Palestinians were uh, run over, uh, otherwise injured. And then they say that a short while later, as that convoy continued to move north toward northern Gaza, uh, that there were Palestinians who approached Israeli troops who were actually protecting that checkpoint. Uh, they say that the Israeli military uh, fired warning shots into the air, and then when those Palestinians continued moving toward them, uh, they eventually sh uh, shot live rounds at those Palestinians. Now, no video uh, of any Palestinians approaching <coughs> Israeli troops has yet been released uh, by the Israeli military, although they do say uh, they are investigating, while the National Security Council, uh, in light of those comments from President Biden, uh, said, that this is a very serious incident that they also are looking at. But what this really makes clear, Jose, is that the humanitarian crisis and the war in Gaza, the, the, the active combat, these are no longer distinct calamities for the Palestinian people. It shows... Which, once more, the, the fault should fall upon the, the, uh, the feet well, of, really of Hamas and uh, the Hamas group over there that, that caused this to begin with. It's a no win win situation. That's the reason why today it's more crucial than ever for a two state solution regarding the differences over there because if there's not, this is only going to continue to escalate. And the vast majority of Americans, as well as myself, have never had to live in an environment like that. And to be quite honest with you, I don't want to live in an environment like that because, like I said, once you reach that state, it was similar towards the same state of affairs that happened during the Holocaust of the Jews. Once you have been starved, rats eating on your body, no assistance pertaining to medical uh, um, demands, starvation, the people in that event that was being rounded up herded up like a bunch of cattle towards being killed was actually welcoming death. And I know that sounds incredibly harsh. I know it sounds um, grotesque, but there's worse things that can happen to a human being other than death. And whenever you reach the boiling point of seeing things like this, that's basically where they're at over there. They have reached a state that actually death to them is more appealing than living. I hope to God that the American people never have to um, be exposed to any type of environment like that. Um, it would it, it basically fits underneath the same category as far as I'm concerned uh, whenever 9-11 happened and the airplanes uh, hit the two twin towers that 
at that point in time, people had to make a choice towards either burning up in the building. Of course, they didn't know it was going to fall at that particular time or jumping out the window and, and their lives being taken that way. Now that, my friends, is a situation that you do not want to have to face. And that, my friends, is the reason why the Bible says to pray that you're worthy to escape these things that are going to be befallen upon to the planet in the final and last days because the horrors will be so horrifying that you can't even begin to imagine what a person either should do or will do in the middle of a situation like that. The Bible says to pray that you're either worthy to escape these things that are going to be fallen upon to the earth or pray <clears throat> that you can endure them. Pray that you can endure them. And I'm just afraid that the direction that we're heading in right now on a massive scale, regardless whether it be over in the Middle East, over in the Russia, Ukraine area, or even over in areas like China or, or Japan, North Korea. I'm just afraid that we ain't seen nothing yet in comparison to what we're going to have to see before we're ever, ever going to come close to not only seeing peace over in the Middle East, but peace all over the world. That's the reason why I continue to keep putting out material in regards towards the only thing that can help this world, just as Billy Graham's son, Franklin Graham, continues to keep saying, is God. The only thing that can save us is God. Because it has reached a supernatural level that mankind cannot control this. It's out of control. I do want to make one other comment before I end this particular video. I have posted some stuff on Facebook just as short as, I guess it was after 12 o'clock. I think it was after 12 o'clock when I've done this um, pertaining to the LGBTQ community based upon the facts coming out of the Bible, based upon other people's examples, based upon what the... Uh, Ghana, uh, places over in Africa, has recently voted on towards trying to uh, cut 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 the uh, cut the trace off at the trail, pertaining to intervening in in uh, seeing how harsh that situations has become over there in Africa, that they're now beginning to awaken, similar towards how that they awakened in the 1600s. Not only here in America, but over Europe and places like that pertaining to witchcraft and open um, sorcery. That there comes a time to where people has to acknowledge that the reason why that the harshness of the bad luck has been falling up into their lives is because of certain activities going on around them that they allowed. And I'm just afraid that America is going to have to face, face off on this if we do not soon and I do mean soon, awaken to what we have allowed to go on around us that I've used this expression there before, that the Bible says that whenever it rains upon the just, it also rains upon the unjust. In other words, it's not just going to be the good farmer that's going to receive the blessing, but it's also going to be the bad one. Well, you can turn that around. Whenever the wrath of God falls upon a humanity, it's not just going to fall upon the guilty, but it's also going to fall upon to the innocent. Now, this is where the innocent needs to awaken and say, you know what, maybe we shouldn't have allowed for that stuff to have been on TV. Maybe we shouldn't have allowed for that stuff to have been on the internet. Maybe we shouldn't have allowed that group of people down the road that was doing this all in the name of religion towards basically being whatever that they was being. And that's where the people has to stand up against the unrighteousness. That way the Heavenly Father will bless this planet versus cursing it. Right now we are under a curse. And the people that should be held accountable for that curse, it should not be myself, the one that had to go up into the uh, hills up in Kentucky 
and basically pray down this curse. But the people that should be held accountable for the curse is the people that did not act and did not respond properly during the time that the founder of the Windmill Ministries was pumping out so much material in the Northwest Tennessee area, as well as Pennsylvania and Washington, D.C. and New York and all these other areas that I've spread abroad the gospel towards trying to warn people and give out advisories about these occurrences that I was trying to prevent from occurring. Because the whole time that I've stepped out into the eyes of the people, the main incentive, other than the incentive towards whosoever calleth upon the name of the Lord shall be saved, the main incentive, other than the incentive that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, was the incentive towards a temporary peace and utopia. Now, you can be like my son if you want to be, and you can say, well, you're a liar. And you can actually go as far as what some of these people in Northwest Tennessee around here has, has been a part of, including the courts, and basically either blaming me or sitting idly by and allowing for the hardship to fall up into our lives that basically costed my only remaining living sibling at the time, which was David Jeffrey Jackson, his death at the age of 51. Now you can sit idly by and you can just, you know, blame everybody but yourself. But the fact of the matter is it's all our faults who did not stand up and properly do the proper and right thing. Now, I realize that beauty is in the eyes of the beholder, and some people are going to look at the glass towards it being half full, towards it being positive, while others are going to look at the glass towards it being half empty. I realize that. But the fact of the matter is, somebody has to draw a conclusion in saying, why has this occurred? And how can we prevent from it occurring? Because as I have said, the fault of an individual praying down the wrath of God upon a society pertaining to condemnation should not be looked upon as the individual that actually prayed that prayer, but it should be looked upon as in what provoked that individual that he or she actually had to do that. It's the same, it's the same concept of looking at how come God destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah or how come God destroyed the old world pertaining to the great flood. Well, in lots of ways, it was actually a, um, a civilized thing to do by, by getting people out of their misery of the state of affairs that was going on during that time, similar towards a mercy killing. Because it had reached that level of ungodliness upon to the planet that the Heavenly Father had to do something because there was not a movement coming from humanity. There was not a movement. And because things was only drawing and getting proportionally worse and worse and worse, that's whenever the Heavenly Father was provoked in making a decision towards saying, now what do I do? Obviously, the human race is at the point of no return. Now, what do I do? Do I let them just continue to suffer and suffer and suffer and so many innocent lives are going to suffer along with it? Or do I put it all to an end? And that's the threshold that we're heading towards right now, not only in America, but throughout the world, that if things continue to draw worser and worser and worser pertaining to our activities, pertaining to uh, the way that we treat one another, the way that we uh, worship uh, openly, uh, with all this sorcery and ungodliness, um, basically all these different types of occultists that's moved into our area, that if we allow for that to go on for a certain amount of time, that's whenever you're pushing God, you're provoking God into the same decision that God had to make in other cultures and other generations. And don't think for a second that he won't make it because he will. He will make that decision, and once he makes that decision, that decision will be made. I'm glad that that's above and beyond my pay grade, and I'm glad that I'm not the one that had to make that decision. The only thing that I know that God has appointed me 
for me to be a messenger with a certain particular message pertaining to Christ, not the Antichrist, but the Lord Jesus Christ. And as of today, February, I think it's the 29th, I think this is leap year, as of today, I have still not seen a productive open movement regarding a Holy Ghost anointing revival that was stemmed off from the Windmill Ministries uh, missions here at 291 Thompson Road, Sharon, Tennessee, zip code 3255. Now you can talk the talk all you want. You can gossip. You can backbite. You can say, well, we intended... But intentions are just like raindrops. If, it, if the raindrop never hits the ground, my friends, it ain't going to be worth nothing. It's worthless. Now, some people look at this situation the same way that, that even Winston Churchill looked at this situation by saying it's unpreventable. And if that's what you feel and if that's what you look at and that's how you understand things, well, then there's nobody that can change your opinion about this similar towards my son that his biological dad, the one speaking in behind the camera right now, was nothing but a liar. But I promise you, my testimony is not a lie. I promise you the things that I have witnessed and that I have experienced, regardless whether it was on a physical level or a supernatural level, has not been lies. Now, you can be narrow-minded like him and say, well, Dad, you was lying the whole time about, about the Bible, pertaining to the first seal. The fact of the matter is I can look through people like my son, Nicholas, and I can actually say that it's not my son that's blaming his dad, but rather it's my son that's blaming God and blaming the people that wrote the Bible in regards towards the prophecies of the Bible. So I've been basically a whipping post for people like my son that it's easier for them to say that I was wrong and they was right, even though the whole time they should be blaming themselves rather than blaming the messenger because they didn't like the message. And you can't tell me as much time and energy that I have spent towards putting this message out to the general public that once more, beauty is in the eyes of the beholder. It's not what you're looking at, but how that you're looking at it, that people took and read the things that I was talking about in Revelations chapter 6, verses 1 and 2, 3 and 4, 5 and 6, 7 and 8, pretending to the four horsemen out of the seven seals, and they took it out of perspective. And they was basically lashing out at me, using me as a whipping post, whenever their intentions was actually meant towards God the Father, because I didn't write the Bible. I didn't write it, didn't have nothing to do with it, other than the fact of me being a carrier to it. Now, rather not you want to support the message, which obviously for the past 30 some odd years, I've not had supporters in the Northwest Tennessee area, much less Pennsylvania and Washington, D.C. and New York and all these other areas that, that now are familiar with me. Or you can have a different opinion. Now, what's more, I put out some material that is very, very sensitive just within the past 24 hours that I was shunned over Facebook originally by putting out this material. I can only tell you what the Bible says that is going to occur if we as a society continue on a bad path. I pray to God that we, can, that we don't stay on a bad path. I pray to God that we will change from the path that we're on and that we will get more on a path of righteousness, godliness. But once more, whenever you have so many people that's confused, whenever you have so many different uh, messages that's going out to the people that, that don't know heads from tails, tails from heads, you're going to have a chaotic situation. Well, these are the things that the Luciferian Lucifer intends to put upon to society. He intends to bring chaos, disorder, cruelty to the humans. Because it was him himself that made the wrong choice in trying to be 
not only disobedient, but basically attacking the kingdom of God in the way that he did, and basically a third of the angels at the time followed after him. Lucifer chose his own demise because the Bible says to whom much is given, much is required, and there's always been and always will be more accountability of the supernatural pertaining to the spiritual than it will be the fleshly. Now, if Satan can draw all of us that's in the flesh right now into the same level of devastation, then he has succeeded by bamboozling the people again down here on the planet the same way that he did during the era that God was provoked in having to destroy the old world or destroy certain cities like Sodom and Gomorrah and other cities that we know that harshness has fallen upon to that group of people. I say this, my friends, in concern and love in the things that are going on right now that should not be going on, not just in America, but throughout the world. Good luck to each and every one of us. I want to pray for all the victims over there in the Middle East on both accounts because war has never been a glamorous thing. I don't know what it's going to take. I'm not over there doing the negotiation in the Hamas uh, two-state party Pakistani um, events going on right now. I just know that looking at it from, from the angle that I'm looking at it, it's bad. And it's only getting worse. And it's only going to get worser until certain people decides to surrender and reconform in their ideology, regardless whether they like it or not. It's only going to get worse because, like I said, ultimately, whenever there is a war, an actual war, neither side wins because there'll be casualties. There'll be collateral damage on both sides that ultimately will have to suffer. This is the reason why diplomacy is always better than an all-out-and-out war. Setting down, negotiating, talking it over versus fighting about it. Let's talk about it. Good luck to all of us. God bless America. God bless our troops. And good luck and where we go from here on and trying to establish the things that the Heavenly Father desires for us to establish. Shalom.